opinions. We all have them, and sometimes we disagree over our respective opinions. So what I wanted to do is endeavour to find the most controversial opinions I could find within my own viewer base and discuss them, see whether I agree or disagree with them, and yeah, basically just have a fun, good old time. And I got a whole lot of responses to go through, like holy cow. So this is probably going to be a multi-part series where I'm just going over controversial opinions. So if you enjoy it, be sure to give it a like. Feel free to subscribe if you're new, which when I get to 20,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So any support would be greatly appreciated on that front. I also have a Twitter and an Instagram, which if you want to follow, the link will be in the description. But with that said, let's get into the video. This is from Jessica. Rose is one of the most unlikable companions we've had. This is not a criticism of writing quality. So this is referring to Rose from obviously series one and two. Now, the thing about Rose being unlikable is that series two, she isn't as good, in my opinion, as series one. I think the whole sort of love romance angle makes her a bit too cutesy and a bit too, I don't know, sort of cheesy. However, I don't see Rose's flaws as a negative. I think as a result, I find her more relatable because at the end of the day, when we first meet Rose, she's meant to be like a 19 year old kid. You know, she's meant to be well, my age now. And I can tell you for a fact that I would make plenty of mistakes traveling with the doctor. So I personally don't mind that she's a flawed character or that she, you know, can sometimes be maybe perhaps a bit emotionally immature because she's 19, of course she's going to be. I do get why people find that irritating, but personally I don't mind it and I think it makes sense. And I think it'd be weird if they didn't. Like one of my main issues with like say the Chibnall Companions for example is that they're meant to be like 19 and you know, sort of learning the ways of things and like Yaz is just perfect from the word go. I would rather have someone with flaws than not. Even if those flaws do make her harder to like at times. This one's from Ethan. K9 is one of the worst companions ever. Here's the thing. I've seen a few of his classic outings and yeah, he kind of has to be written out a lot due to basically the prop malfunctioning. I don't know whether I would go as far to call him the worst. It's difficult to really rank him because he's a robot dog. It's harder to really compare him to others. I think he works better in limited capacities than as a main part of like a TARDIS dynamic. So for example, when, you know, School Reunion reintroduces him and he's like sort of there as like a reminder of the past and an allegory for Mickey's dynamic in the TARDIS team. I think he works really well there. They use him quite sparingly in Sarah's Rain Adventures and I think he works quite well there. I think also the more childlike tone of that show kind of aids in his dialogue. But, you know, I don't mind K9 too much. I wouldn't go as far as to say he's the worst. There's companions I like a hell of a lot less. And considering he's a dog, you know, that's quite an achievement. Season 1 with the ninth Doctor is overrated. It's got some good episodes, but it has a lot of cringe-worthy scenes that I usually skip when I do a rewatch. I strongly disagree with that. Series 1 is probably, like, one of my favourites of the revival. I personally love a lot of it. I'll give you this. There are some moments, I think more visually than anything, that haven't aged the best. Like things like, I guess, uh, the nesting consciousness, the almighty Jagrafest. That hasn't aged particularly well visual things but i think for the most part it's really really solid it's in my top three new who series i think dan lewis is the worst doctor who companion of the modern era zero character development and is basically a worse version of graham i'm inclined to agree with this sentiment i wouldn't go as far as to say he's the worst i dislike ryan more although you could argue that ryan has more going on but i find john bishop to be a more entertaining presence than ryan I'd definitely say Dan is one of the more superfluous companions of the modern era. Like, I don't really know why he was really introduced, because it feels like Flux, he's just sort of there, and the specials, he's just kind of there. I guess you could say that he comforts Yaz about, you know, her blossoming feelings for the Doctor, but that's really fleeting at best and doesn't really lead to anything. So I wouldn't say worse, but I would say most pointless, if that makes sense. This one's from an awful Jack saying, Spyfall, the one aside, is dreadful. I personally quite like part one. However, part two, I think, really dropped the ball. I think part two is a bit of a mess, but I like part one well enough. I think it's a fun, if light, sort of spy thing, but part two really just, it does that chimnal thing of let's just introduce 50 million things for no reason. So I'm sort of in agreement, but not all the way on that one. This one's from Hyrge saying, 
The Weeping Angel Tea Party in Series 5 is kind of overrated. I would disagree. I would go as far as to say it's better than Blink, in my opinion. That's my hot take. I think it's way more interesting. I think it's got some good twists, like that moment where you realise that all of the statues in the cave are actually Weeping Angels. I think it's got a great sense of scope. And yeah, I really enjoy that two-parter, personally. John Dorney, of Big Finish fame, said, It's not my favourite, but I have a sneaky feeling Happiness Patrol is the best and richest story the old series ever did, maybe Kinder. I'm actually inclined to agree. The Happiness Patrol has always been a personal favourite of mine. Obviously, a lot of people take it as a commentary on, like, Thatcherism, which you can argue it definitely is. However, I think it kind of works as a commentary on the modern wave of toxic positivity and, like, internet circles and the idea that any form of critical thought or discourse is like somehow reducing people's happiness when in reality it's just a part of being human having negative emotions are just as valid as positive emotions i think that story can be read and interpreted in a lot of different ways and i definitely think it's one of those ones that like you can constantly revisit and sort of take new things from love and monsters is the best episode of doctor who i mean I quite enjoy it, but I don't know whether I'd go that far. The way I've always looked at Love and Monsters is, again, kind of a commentary on fandom, with, obviously, Russell T. Davis even stating, I think, that Victor Kennedy is meant to be a sort of demonstration of Ian Levine. And as I've grown older, I kind of see myself in the different characters in that story, if you look at it through that sort of fandom angle. I mean, think about it. You know, Elton is some sort of dirty blonde British guy speaking into a camera in his mum's basement, talking about the Doctor. Who could possibly relate to that? This one's from Shakespeare 3. Stephen Moffat has the best Christmas episodes. I'm actually thinking of doing a video comparing the approaches of RTD and Moffat when it comes to Christmas specials. I think both of them have some strong outings. I will say, while I'm not sure which one I prefer, I'd say Stephen Moffat has my favourite Christmas story, Christmas Carol, if you're curious. Although I do think he has his fair share of blunders as well, mainly... Return of Doctor Mysterio, Last Christmas. Basically the Capaldi ones I don't think are great. Chris says, Blink is incredibly overrated. The Cybermen have never fully reached their potential on screen. It's about time the Master and Davros stay dead. So taking that step by step, because there's quite a few little, uh, you know, nuggets of controversy in there. Blink is incredibly overrated. I wouldn't say incredibly, it's still a really strong story. But I wouldn't call it my favourite story of the revival. I enjoy it, but I do think there are better stories than it that exist. The Cybermen have never reached their full potential on screen. I think there are moments where they do, but I do definitely think New Who kind of squanders a lot of that potential, in particular. And even Classic Who, you know, as great as stories like Earthshock are, they basically are just foot soldiers in those stories. So I'm inclined to agree that they definitely have more potential to be explored. But then occasionally you'll get stories like One of Time Doctor Falls, which I feel do an incredible job at showing, you know, what the Cybermen can be in the right hands. And then it's about time the Master and Davros stay dead. The Master, I agree. I've said before, unless you give him, like, a spin-off or something, I think his role as, like, the evil Doctor is, like, really played out and, you know, he should be retired. Davros I don't mind as much because I feel like there is more you can do with him and we don't see him as often as the Master, in my opinion. So I'm more open to him coming back. But the Master in particular, yeah, I do agree. Bad Wolf 66. The Paradigm Daleks were mistreated by fans and deserve a second chance. They had massive potential, but they never allowed to show it. Moffat should have ignored fans and just went ahead with his original plan for the Paradigm Daleks. Yes! Bad Wolf, I could kiss you. You're my favourite person. Yes, I completely agree. The Paradigm Daleks are nowhere near as bad as people made out that they were. Yes, okay, they kind of looked a bit clunky in Victory, but I think that's more just the tiny set that they put them in that made the tall Daleks look really weird. Also, I feel like if they started with the Chrome Daleks that we get in Asylum, people would have been way more chill with that. I definitely think they had a lot of potential, and I always felt it a shame that they never came back, because I personally, I grew up with kind of Victory of the Daleks in Series 5. That was kind of like my first big series that I was, you know, there on broadcast for. And I always felt it a shame that we never really saw them again properly after that point. So I completely agree. I think they deserved a second chance. Maybe we'll see them again, but I'm doubtful at this point. Nick Ferraza says, Not sure if this is controversial, but it definitely feels like I might be alone in it. I don't want an 8th Doctor spin-off. I love Paul McGann as the Doctor, but we don't need two Doctor shows. It had muddy the waters. So the reason I'm highlighting this comment is actually because this is a sentiment I saw quite a bit in one of my previous videos talking about what Doctor Who spin-offs I would do, and basically saying how if you have more than one Doctor in a spin-off, then it kind of makes the current incarnation less valuable. 
I would disagree in so much as I think people are way more used to the idea of multiple versions of a character existing simultaneously. I mean, look at superheroes, they do it all the time. Even things like Sonic the Hedgehog, there's different variations of that, and they can coexist and have different versions and it's kind of fine. If this argument was being made like say 10, 15 years ago, I'd be inclined to agree, but now I think people are more than like willing to accept. Okay, there's more than one version of this thing. Doug says, sick of the child is being like a bus. Companions popping home to their lives again is boring should be about lost in time and space again. So I personally disagree and the reason I do is because I think part of the reason the revival worked is because they added some of the domesticity of more modern contemporary shows and I think it really paid off in New Who's favour. With that being said, I probably would say I would want less of that in RTD2 as opposed to RTD1, just because it was so prevalent in RTD1, and I also think that, as I've kind of stated before, people are more used to more elaborate, like, sort of storylines in media now, so I think you can kind of get away with that without having to tether it to Earth all the time. And finally, I'm going to go for this one from Yannick. Okay, listen, I love David Tennant. I love, love, love him. I really do. He's the best, and Ten is great. He's amazing. Like, seriously brilliant but I do think 10 is a tad overrated, overhyped. So, this is funny because I actually agreed with this a while ago. I was in the camp of, okay, he's not that good. He used to rank sort of middling in my tiers of Doctors, but I must admit, re-watching a lot of his stories, there's a reason he is as well liked as he is, in my opinion at least. I think if you look for the more alien aspects of the Doctor, you might be a little bit put off by Ten because he is that more humanised Doctor, the one that kind of relates and empathises with humanity the most and wants to live their lives. However, I do also think that that leads to him being one of the more nuanced and sort of, I guess, flawed Doctors, but I think that's a positive. I think it's cool to have a Doctor that is so fallible, is so emotional, I think that makes them more relatable. So I think Ten is quite unique in that regard of just sort of being quite human-like and actually wearing his emotions firmly on his chest. When he's upset about something, he can't really hide it. And I do think that makes him unique amongst other incarnations. So personally, I wouldn't call him overrated these days. However, I do get why that complaint exists. But hey, I think that's going to wrap up part one of maybe this series if you guys enjoy it. What are your controversial opinions? Let me know in the comments below. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new and I'll see you later.